And uh, 2024, he said, will be a year of peace and joy. Thank God 2023 is about over. <laughs> joy, Carrie, joy, joy. <laughs> we all went through the fire in 2023, at least around here. Um, but we're still here. We came through it. We came through it. And I'm excited about the youth. Nisi and Carl will be heading up the youth for 2024 and hopefully throughout. So at New Year's night, I want you to be prepared to sow into the youth. I'm prepared to sow into the youth. The Lord told me to sow in $5,000 into the youth program, and I'm going to do that. And I think we need to buy a new van for the youth. That old van out there has been so faithful. How old is that? How long have we had that van? <laughs> 13, 2013. So, you know, we can't put young people in something old. So I want something fresh and new. New wineskin van. <laughs> buy two. George said buy two. You can buy one and we'll draw the other one. <laughs> buy two of them. How many of y'all live by your checkbook? Raise your hand. Praise God. I might have the wrong message tonight for the wrong church. <laughs> that was a trick. I was in here, I got back from New, uh, Highlands. We try to go once a year up there just to, sh just to shut in and relax. And, and I went through, I was on my fourth ink pen. Every time I went into worship, the Lord would just pick up my hand and write and write and write and write and write for 2024 20, hours sending stuff to Weta, sending stuff to Weta. thank God for Weta. thank God for Sheralina thank God for for Ashley and all the ones that are working in this building to make things happen for us because if it wasn't for them we would not I couldn't stand up here it's the people behind the scene that deserves greater honor Amen. So let's give them some honor. Margie, I, I'm sorry if I didn't mention anybody's name, but you know who you are. So I want to teach on the reason many Christians don't receive blessings that they deserve in the kingdom. There's so many blessings in the kingdom of God that I see a lot of Christians aren't walking in. And it kind of grieves me. It kind of puts a heavier burden on me to seek the Lord for answers for you and for the rest of the church. Uh, uh, you know, whoever you talk to, whoever you evangelize. Uh, I know we got evangelists that bring lost souls in, and we got evangelists that, that bring carnal people in to maturity. And Carrie's one of those guys. Prayers that don't get answered. Multiplication of finances, etc. Those kind of things. God's kingdom, listen, God's kingdom operates totally different from the kingdom that you're in this world. You, nothing's going to work for you if you use the world's way to get the kingdom of God to respond to you. It's not going to work. And that's what frustrates a lot of carnal Christians because they have not had the old wineskin renewed to a new wineskin. Now, what are you saying when I say that? That means your mind has to be renewed to create an, a new wineskin. The mind is the facilitator of creating a new wineskin to hold the new wine. So what is the new wine? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been locked up in here for so long and never got into the soul. 
So the soul is going to be the new wine skin that holds the Holy Spirit that can get out to the world. And, uh, you know, we see these babies in here. We see them praising them. I just thank God that the parents are bringing the babies. Because, listen, they're receiving more than you are. They just came from that place. Our filters are dirty. We've been here for a long time. They got clean filters. And they're receiving more than what you, what you think they're receiving. I think sitting in a worship place is better for them than in a Sunday school because there's divine intervention happening that's tailored to that person and they don't even know it so if you can just get them to come in and sit in the presence come in and, and, and let them sit after praise and worship and worship with us so much is happening man I wish my parents would have took us to church but now I'm glad they didn't because I would have been messed up the Lord said, don't go to church. He said, I'm going to teach you. Why would he say that? Apparently, the church is not teaching the full gospel of Jesus Christ. There's so many pastors out there that I've seen that the, the anointing is already lifted. And you know how the anointing just, just keeps going. You know, when Adam fell from glory, the glory remained on him for 900 years. Can you imagine? For 900 years, God was not with him. The difference is going to be people are not getting changed. People are not getting changed. They're in the same rotation. Every, they're doing their duty to come to church. This is not a duty church. This is not a dirty church. <laughs> so listen. Christians are supposed to sow time in serving God and being with God and love and loving God and loving people and sowing God's money. Doesn't the Bible say we're not our own? We're not our own? So then why do we hold on to money so tight? Okay, so fear is a good answer. But we hold on to money so tight that the Bible says it leads you to poverty. It leads you to poverty. Don't you get frustrated when you don't have the money to do something? Don't you get frustrated when, when you don't have the money to help someone? When you see an, a need which is an alm moment and you don't have $10,000 to give that person to get them out of some kind of crisis or debt, doesn't that just grieve you? It grieves me. Money is not yours we've got to get a hold of that if we hold on to it I'm going to be teaching about money tonight but I'm going to be teaching how money should flow from your hands to get results God gave me three visions that's the way he works with me obviously he gives me visions he gave me three visions a few years ago and he just added to those visions more revelation on this trip of how the king how money works how money flows in the kingdom of God no Christian should be in lack no Christian should not have enough money to do not only what God's called them to do but to be free no debt no Christian should, should be in debt. No Christian should, should, you should have enough money. God did that for me because I got the order right. And I didn't even know I was getting it right. 
I was just being led by the Spirit all these 20-something years, just being led by the Spirit, worshiping God, pushing into God, wanting more of God. And the whole time, he was aligning me with the way he does things. And when he said, open up a church, I had the money to do it. It cost about two or $300,000 to open up this church. But it's his money. And it's so easy to give away when it's his. That's the key. If you have this mindset that it's his, and he just spoke to me to give it, the devil's not going to tell you to give. So that's how you know it's God. The devil is a thief. He steals. He wants you in poverty. I don't care what color you are. It doesn't matter in the kingdom. You should be rich in him. And he will make you wealthy if you are rich in him. So after the night, he's going to let, he said, Gene, I want you to impart grace, the grace that I put you, that I put on your life for giving in the right way, in the right order. He said, I'm going to, he said, I just want you to impart into them. He said, as soon as you lay your hands on them, everything's going to come into alignment like that. That's going to be so, man, you're going to feel so free. I am so free. Say, Gene is so free. <laughs> because of him and because of obedience and because of worship and because of loving Mason and Larry. <laughs> I love those guys. I love those guys. I'm going to give you some little nuggets first to kind of prime you for this message. God encourages us to give liberally. And when we do, we imitate him. The, the clothes that you're wearing are not yours. He clothes you. If, you didn't, if he didn't give you money... You couldn't buy those clothes. It's his body, and he wants it clothed. Think about that. You can give your clothes away. I give my clothes away all the time. Once a year, I put them in a big bag and give them away. Just to keep the rotation going. Because if I let it go, he's going to give me seed to buy more to enjoy it, and then let it go again. So every year I do that. Carl has just anointed clothing on. I don't know where he got it from. <laughs> and Joshua. Joshua. I, I noticed when I gave him those, those shirts and stuff, all hell broke loose. They got in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> it's true. I said, this is going to work. <laughs> this is going to bring everything to light. <laughs> so I got a bag ready to give. God wants to do a work in our hearts towards giving in 2024. He said, obedience is transformational power. So revelation transforms obedience makes everything new that's been my key right there every time he gave me a revelation I obeyed it he said God 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 never asked us to do something that he doesn't give us the grace to do it tonight there is going to be an impartation of grace To clean the filter. To flush out the lies of the enemy. To flush out fear. To flush out carnality. You know that giving, generous giving, 
as a sign, and we're, we're in the month of giving, right? This is when God gave his son to us. Can you imagine? I don't think any of us could send our baby on that cross. That's why he had to turn his back. And when he turned his back, he couldn't watch it. Didn't he turn his back? He turned his back. He couldn't watch it. We're in that mo this month right now. So, so generous giving is a sign. If you want to know that you are mature, it's going to be in your giving record. It's going to be in your checkbook. Where does most of your money go? Mine goes into the kingdom. That's the sign of maturity is your giving record. He said giving overcomes financial fear and worry. One, one thing I love about giving, it makes you secure. Don't you feel security when you give? And when you don't give, you feel unprotected? Fear comes, anxiety comes, what's going to happen next? What's going to cost me this? It's going to cost me that. I had to minister to Zenny a little while in Highlands. I said, look, the word of God is all we have to defeat the enemy. You can't fight this devil carnally. In fact, if anybody has an enemy working against them, opposing them, adverse to them, go to that references for life there. You don't have to buy that one. There's some paper ones in the back. And there's a title that says, Defeat the Enemy. And it's about 20 scriptures. And the Lord said, if you just pray those out and start getting them in your spirit where you don't have to read it to pray it out, that's when you'll have the victory. So in other words, you became that word. And when you pray it out, that is the sword. The sword is not you reading it. Because you are the sword. You become the word. The word is the sword of the spirit. So giving destroys the stronghold of poverty. He said giving always provides, and I love this, I love this. My giving has always provided me sound direction I never doubted in my choices the people around me might doubt but because I'm a giver there is a sound direction and guidance for life that comes through giving if the young ones would just learn how to sow if it's a penny, it doesn't matter to God. He just wants you to get a revelation that it belongs to him. And if you'll get that little cycle going, by the time you're my age, that, that, that circle is going to be bigger than the earth because you don't stop the cycle. You keep the cycle going. And it starts snowballing. It starts snowballing. And at some point, God has given you more than you ever gave. More than you ever gave. So giving overcomes financial fear and worry. Giving brings order to financial management. Our prior priorities become different. Mason is a financial manager, and he's a godly financial manager. The Lord leads him by the Spirit. Giving destroys the stronghold of poverty. So listen, giving always provides guidance. Giving is the report card for maturity. God is looking for fully committed believers. Second Chronicles, is it? Is it Second Chronicles 16.9, I think. Put that up. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth 
to show himself strong on behalf of those who, whose heart is loyal to him. And in this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have war. So a heart that's not loyal, there's going to be war all around you constantly. Just constantly. Trouble all around you constantly. Pull right into it. But he said a loyal heart. His eyes are looking for loyal hearts. So giving opens up the door to possess what's in the kingdom. All these things that are in the kingdom, you can't see until you're born again. He'll begin to show you what he wants for you. When he shows you what he wants for you, he wants you to sow. I'm going to step you through this process of how this works. You have to sow. Christ-like giving is generous blessings to others and advancing the kingdom. Listen, every test, every test, every trial, every tribulation that you go into, the test, there's three tests, and you can judge it by, by the circumstance of the trial. So the three tests is truth, love, and giving. What is this trial, this circumstance demanding of me right now? Is it to hold on to a truth? Is it to love my enemy? Is it to sow into the kingdom right now? For a divine shift in my life. So those three things. You can always tell truth, love, and money. First Chronicles echoes the words, heaven and earth is the Lord's. The Lord said, wealth and honor come from him. Wealth and honor come from him. Instead of being owner of a few material possessions as a child of God, you manage, you come into a place of managing the Father's wealth, which is the whole earth. What was one of the Beatitudes? Who inherits the whole earth? The meek. The meek. So people who hold on to money are not meek. People who hold on to money are not humble. Because money has become a God to them. Because it's a security. If God spoke tonight and said, tell them all, to empty out their checkbooks right here at this altar tonight. I wonder how many people would come up. I would, because I've seen it. I've seen how this thing works. I've emptied my checkbook out twice. Gave him everything. So he could do something for someone else. But there's something lacking with Christians in this order of giving. And, and the Lord said it's the priceless place that they're lacking in. I'm going to share with that tonight. What, what is that? What, I want to get that part right. He said, until money is managed to advance the kingdom, we will not be aligned with this purpose and his destiny for your life. You will never enter into your destiny till you know how to manage his money. And there's a lot of frustrated Christians. The, the, what is it? Two des best days of your life is when you were born and why? The why is still on their forehead. Why? Why am I here? Till you get the money thing right, you're always going to have why on your forehead. And the devil's going to 
take you from to and fro. The Bible says he takes you to and fro, to and fro, back and forth, back and forth, from job to job, from this to that. Finally, you're going to come to the end of yourself because there's no growth in going back and forth. There's no growth in it. The growth is on the path of life. So until money, he said, God watches us carefully for he knows that our actions reveal the heart, the motives of our heart. Turn to 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 18. Let's read that in a minute. He said to command those who are rich. So he's saying that you can be rich, right? So he said, command those who are rich in this present age not to be prideful, nor to trust in those riches, but in the, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Amen. Man, hey, Charlie. Hey, Charlena. He richly gives us all things to enjoy. When the Bible says things, he's talking about material things that he gave man the wisdom to create. It amazes me that when man first showed up on the earth, it was just dirt. This building was created out of dirt. Think about the airplanes created out of dirt. The wisdom that God has given man to create is blows my mind. But he give us the wisdom to create to we, so we can enjoy what he has created through us with him. With him. Remnant churches. You're a remnant church. Thank God you are called out. Amen? And you are supposed to be wealthy. I am no different than you. God has surrounded me with very smart people because he knows I need smart people around me. Amen. Amen. Zenny, Lee, Ashley, all these all these beta, kappa, kappa, cup of what? Kappa, kappa. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> God gives me grace to uphold my hands so I can do his ministry and he's given me awesome people such awesome people I thank him every morning for, the, for everyone he said as we learn this, did I finish that let them do good that they be, may be rich in good works ready to give when I come out of my war room every day I am ready to give I keep a little money pouch with me all the time because I am not going to be without seed and miss my moment. The easiest way for you to give to start this is when you're at McDonald's, pay for the guy behind you. And I'll bet you he'll pay for the guy behind him. And it'll keep going because that's what grace does. Grace attaches itself to giving. If everybody gave in this ministry, we would have a school for these children. We'd have that building across the street. If everybody gave like they're supposed to. But statistically, 20% only give in a church. That's amazing to me. You know what that tells me? They were never born again. 
They were saved, but they were never born again because the Holy Spirit will convict you. He'll convict you. He'll say, give here. He'll impress you to give something there. He will do it. So as we learn to the responsibility of kingdom wealth, we develop the qualities to reign in life. So listen, facing God, the source of abundance, drives away the fear and insecurity and powerlessness. Now listen to this, powerlessness of previously feeling the powerlessness you've previously felt as you watch things go by that should have been yours. That's why people get angry or jealous for people that have everything. Because they should have it. What are they doing wrong? Why don't they have it? Think about that. What am I doing wrong? What's my part in this? To get this financial thing right. No Christian should be working for a paycheck. Every Christian should be working to give. And every Christian should give to have life. And every Christian has life to glorify God. That's how it works. So when you go to work for your paycheck, you got to change your mindset. This is not going to pay my bills. My giving is going to pay my bills. I've seen some of the, some of the ones in the ministry, they, they've gotten hold of this thing. And I see God taking care of them. When you reach, reach that status, you expect every need <clears throat> to be met at the right time. <clears throat> Isn't it amazing how it comes at the right time? Just when you need it, it shows up. You expect that nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. Giving strengthens, and I, I, I've seen this in my life. Giving strengthens faith for other areas. Where your faith may be weak, if you'll give, God will strengthen that faith that we're weak in. The Bible says you're not, we're not supposed to come into the house of God without an offering. I mean, are us are missing that. I think God created Givelify. <laughs> You can just get on your phone and do it right then. But it says, it says, don't come into the house of God. It didn't say the church. He said the house of God. What's the difference? What's the difference between the house of God and the church? The presence of God. The church has the anointing. The house of God has both. In the church, you can't, get, you can't sit there for 45 minutes and you get antsy. In the house of God, you'll stay forever because it's your home. It's where the presence of God is. Your citizenship is in heaven. This is just a place for God to rest and be with his people. I don't know about you. I can stay all night. I turn up these instrumentals and lay on this floor. So giving is your security. Listen, I once held many things in my hands. As in an apostolic function, wealth is called to apostles. It's an anointing. Because an apostle is supposed to have the wisdom to give it away. 
and help the church and help things grow. So, Apostle, <laughs> these babies are doing good. I said, I, I, once I held, every, things would come to me so easily in my 20s. And they would leave so easily. <laughs> it is amazing how just, I didn't have time to enjoy it before it left. So listen, I once held many things in my hands and have lost them all through circumstances because there was no hedge of protection. But listen to this. Whatever I placed in God's hands, that I still possess. That I'll never lose. He said, if I can get prosperity through you, I can send it to you. What's the soul, soul supposed to do? Produce prosperity. Father God, he said he wants to make you sure. He wants to make sure. He said, tell them, I, I want to make sure that they're well taken care of in these end times it's all about grace I looked up the definition of grace because there's so many definitions and this is the Greek definition this is the accurate definition it says non-meritorious or unearned favor <clears throat> bestowed as a gift freely and never as a reward for work performed isn't that amazing? That God gives you favor for something you didn't do? For something you didn't work for? He said, Gene, that's the central characteristics of me, is grace. Listen, I've not met one person when he or she began giving on a regular basis at God's direction who did not discover the joy of being a generous giver. Man, we're talking about joy tonight. There's so much joy in giving. So much joy in giving. Why did he say it's more blessed to give than to receive? The world says it's more blessed to receive than to give. But why did Jesus say it's more blessed to receive? More blessed to give than receive. Yeah. Why did he say that? Why do you think he said it? What is the principle of being more blessed to give than to receive? More blessed to give than to receive. Because he fills you with joy. Joy, listen to this. Joy is the result that something has just been made whole. The psalmist said it's the joy of salvation. Salvation means whole. Something just got whole in your soul. That's why he says more blessed to give because in that obedience, something just got healed in you. And then joy follows. The Lord gave me a revelation. He said, Gene, joy is the sign that you have authority. Joy is the sign of authority. So, 
giving, giving, giving. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you these charts in a minute. Um, I want you to get this order down. Order is necessary for life, not just for giving, but for life. Order is necessary to function effectively. Order is a sign of obedience, respect, and honor for God. The Lord gave me these visions as a divine, listen to this, a divine order of giving that is progressional to meet the will of God. This, this order is a progressional order. It's foundational. He said if we get the foundation built, he can have liberty from the foundation of giving in that order. I've seen it. This foundation says you've got to do this first, this first, this first, this first, and this first. Once that foundation is established, he has liberty to do this first and not this first. Because everything belongs to him in the New Testament. We say we pay 10% tithe, right? Jesus didn't do away with the law. He fulfilled it. So the tithe is a tutor. Just a tutor. But when you get in the New Testament, all of it's the tithes. It all belongs to him. And you're going to find that when you get a re that revelation and you're led by your spirit and not by the law, that you're going to exceed 10% giving. <laughs> And won't even realize that you've given that much. Because grace is in the New Testament. When Jesus showed up, he was the grace of God. So the 10% tithe really is a foundation to get things started. And then when you see what God does out of your obedience that he gives back so much more and he makes you manifold in your sowing that you'll get to the point you won't know what your tithe will be so you have to be led by the spirit ask the spirit what I should give the devil's not going to answer you the flesh is not going to answer you. When you ask the Holy Spirit what to give, He's going to answer you just that quick. If you get a second answer, then it's not God. The devil just showed up to get you to reason back and forth and kill the grace that's on that. It'll kill the grace. So order is necessary. So God is going to unleash the power of a generous heart tonight through giving. Impartation of divine grace. Go to the PowerPoint now. I want to go to uh, the foundational order of giving liberally. Just go to you till you see that little block, foundational order of giving liberally. There it is. Go back. You see the tie, the foundation or order of giving. Go to the next one. You have the tie, the offering, the first fruit, the alm, and the seed. 
Did I miss anything? Dive. Oh, let's see. That's five. You see, the tithe, the offering, and the first fruit belongs to God. The alm and the seed belong to man. So nothing belongs to you. This is Bible. I don't look at my checkbook. Because if I looked at it, I'd, I'd be afraid it'd be empty. Because God empties it. And he puts it back in before I even know it. How many of y'all look at your checkbook? How many of y'all balance a checkbook? Don't raise your hand. Raise your hand in your mind. <laughs> Raise your hand in your mind. The Lord said, once the vertical order of giving is in place, the horizontal order is satisfied. And God and man will begin to pour into your bosom. It's so powerful. Number five in the Greek. That's why I asked how many were up there. It was number five. This means energetic. Now, this is what happens when you give in this order. The Lord said, this is what happens when you give in this order. He said, it's energetic vibration of change. Transformation, shift, healing, and grace. All those are included in that number five. So when you get to number five, which is seed giving, all those things are going to happen. Was that on the screen? Yeah. Thank you. How many of y'all need a transformation in your finances? You can raise your hands. I mean, a real transformation where... If you didn't have a job for 10 years, you'd still have enough to live off of. There you go. I haven't had a job in 15 years. I haven't had a paycheck. And I could probably live another 15 years. And I'm no different than you. In fact, you're a lot smarter than I am. But you may be too smart. Because if you think you can figure it out, you didn't. Because his ways are past figuring out. The just shall live by what? Faith. Transformation means this, a dramatic change in form and appearance. I need a dramatic change in form and appearance of my finances right now. He said there's a divine order for transformation of finances. Jesus made a way through his sacrifice for this to happen. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, let's look at that. You can get a lot of word in this church. You all like that, don't you? Word. So only be careful that, that this liberty of yours, this power to choose, does not somehow become a stumbling block that is a temptation to sin to the weak in conscience. I guess that was it. He said, no Christian should be in lack, but abundantly supplied. Go to the next verse. As it is written, here it is, who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. That's what I say. Jesus. Only Jesus can do that. Let's read it again. 
He who gathered much had nothing left over. And he who gathered little had no lack. Isn't that amazing? That you can keep emptying, emptying out your checkbook and never be in lack. God tested me in this. He said, Gene, I'm raising you up as a model for my kingdom because you're going to be different from the rest of them. And he told me to empty out everything in that business to build that church for Brother Mac. And I did it with joy because he spoke it. It's only in necessity and grudgingly that he hasn't spoken. But when he speaks to give, there's going to be joy. There's going to be joy. There's a divine appointment for everyone in here tonight to give. This may not be your night because you don't want to do it out of necessity or grudgingly. You want to wait till he speaks because that's the only time it's going to have a return on it. The only time. I love that verse. That really motivated me. He said, the more you keep, the more you're going to lose, in other words. Money has to flow. Haggai 1.7. The Lord, said, the Lord of hosts says, consider your ways. Didn't Lee teach on that? You see how the Lord is building steps towards you? Salvation means what? Getting close to God. So consider your ways and thoughtfully reflect on your conduct and how you have progressed. Consider what's out of order by looking at the fruit of your life. Can you look at the fruit of your life? Do you have more than enough? And you can't wait to, for God to speak and say, tell me where to give this. It's a different type of anxiety. I was there many times. I said, Lord, do something. Because it was constantly on my mind that this has to leave me. And he would wait, and he would wait until I come into alignment with the right person. There he is. Boom. Release it. Release it. Second Corinthians 9 6 says, But I say this, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Don't you know you're in control of your financial status? Don't you know you're in control of your health? You're in control of everything. It's, it's your choice. Eternal life, eternal life, listen to this, eternal life. Actually, you control what leaves your hands and your mouth. Eternal life and abundant life attaches itself to sacrificial life. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? He said, we're called to be a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. A living sacrifice. What does that mean? You live by the Spirit. You sacrifice the flesh. Don't live by the flesh. Don't live by what you feel and see and hear and taste and all these things. Because they're leading you down a path of poverty and lack and depression and fear and all this stuff you have to be a living sacrifice now listen how many Christians are living that lifestyle he said you have to understand how money works in the kingdom money in the bride of Christ you know we talk about preparing the bride here right the bride cannot be prepared and made ready till she gets the money thing right. 
you don't want to, he doesn't want to marry a bride that can't handle money. Because you'll be sown into, into the enemy's kingdom. There's more divorces about money than there is anything else. You will not be a bride prepared and ready till you get this money thing right. Why? Because money answers everything. Solomon said wisdom and money answers everything. I can have wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the word of God. Wisdom is Jesus. Wisdom is the truth. I can have all this truth and not handle my money right and not get everything answered that I need. That's why we're in lack. That's why some prayers aren't getting answered. <clears throat> it's going to blow your mind what the missing link is. <clears throat> it's going to blow your mind. I'm moving ahead on the PowerPoint because I've already said a lot of this. Uh, moving past all the bride stuff. And I'm going to go, let's go to Deuteron Deuteronomy 28.12. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 28.12 on your PowerPoint. Charlena, you did this PowerPoint. Yeah, I was going to thank you, but they, Veronica and Ashley did the PowerPoint. Thank you. Veronica's not here tonight. Let's go to, let's go to the verse. 28, let's hurry, please. I don't want to lose this anointing. It's flowing. <clears throat> it's on your PowerPoint. Should be. Are y'all excited to get something right here tonight? Because because what what we this thing the Lord said this is what the church has been missing, and it's affecting everything in their life. The Lord will open for you His good treasure house, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and bless all the works of your hands. Carl was giving me a testimony how he asked the Lord to bless all the works of your hands. Well, you know what happened just then when he did that? <clears throat> he just activated it. This kingdom is voice activated. You have to say something. Lord, bless the works of my hands, and you will lend to many nations and borrow from none. Carl's going to lend to many nations and borrow from none. I need a loan, Carl. <laughs> now you can get loans from the saints. It's not from the bank. <laughs> Atkins Mortgage Company. <laughs> the Lord will make you the head, in other words, a leader, and not the tail, the follower. And you will be above only and not beneath. You will listen and pay attention to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today to observe them carefully. All right, so let's go to the charts. This is the visions. Let's go to the first chart. Nope, keep going. first chart there. Study that for a minute. We did we get copies of this so we can pass them out? Are you? Okay. I, I text you, but maybe you didn't see it. I want them to have these three visions, these three charts. We can do it after because you probably don't want to miss any of this. Okay. Um, how money flows in the kingdom 
you have tithe, offering, first fruit, alms, and seed. For those who don't know this order, you need to put this order in place tonight or tomorrow. But just start putting it in place. Because once you get to the seed, then you have established a foundation for the, listen to this, the Lord just spoke. He said they have established a foundation for the wind to blow. What does he mean? He said in the word that the Holy Spirit is like the wind. You don't know which direction it's going to come from, where it's coming to, what time it's going to come to you. He's going to use you that way in giving off of that foundation. Isn't that beautiful? So he has something to work from. So if you look at this, the tithe is based on Malachi 3, 8, and 10. It says down here that's a commandment. Don't ever break a commandment. It won't be good for you. When God says, do this, that's a commandment. Or when he says, I command you, that's a commandment. Here's a third one. When he gives you a revelation, that's a commandment. That's a commandment. So the offering is in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, 6 through 15. And it says, thankful, thank you, thank you. Say thank you. That's what the offering is for on your part, to say thank you. That's, that's going to be your motivator. The first fruit, Leviticus 23.10 and Proverbs 3.9, is love for God. Love for God. How many of y'all love God? Well, January is coming up. Amen. Alms. Matthew 6, 1, Proverbs 19, 17, Proverbs 28, 7. Alms is love for people. Love for people. And we're going to give you this chart. She's going to pass them out. Seed, Luke 6, 38, advances the kingdom and men begin to pour into your bosom. You ever walk down the street and someone hand you hand you a twenty thousand dollar check? No. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. It happens. It happens. Once that order is established, that foundation is laid because God is very foundational. Many people walk down the street, and there's a Christian. That he touches. He says, write that man a check. Wouldn't you like that? And it could be a check to get you completely out of debt. This, God, th this happens. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for you. Because I've already got this down. And I know how it works. And then when the wind starts blowing... Man, that is so exciting because you don't know when he's going to blow on you to move that grace, to open your hands and give it to someone. Let's go to the next chart. Biblical motivation behind giving. When I saw this in the spirit, man, I love vision. I love, I'm a visionary and I can write and write and I can draw and draw and I just know it's the truth. The tithe is motivation for obedience. The offering is motivation for gratitude. The first fruit is motivation for generosity. Alms is motivation for compassion. Seed is motivation for faith. For faith. 
say for faith. The Lord told me to teach this tonight. And then he said, give them time to work it. And sometime in January, we're going to have a night just for testimony on this. Testimonies on your tithe, testimonies on your offerings, testimony, testimony, testimony. It would just be a night of testimony. So God can be glorified in what he's done for you. Listen, if we're not obeying the word of God, we're under a curse. You know what a curse is? It is it's a bad ending. A curse means this. It's exempt from the life of God. It's exempt from the life of God. God's life is all about life and not death. Man, when I was in my teens, golly, all the wrecks I had, all the the devil was trying to kill me. And I came through all of them. Telephone poles coming through the windshield. Me sliding off the road, going too fast on a curve. Jumped the ditch, hit the pole. The, whole, the pole came back and swung into the windshield. And that was the last thing I remember. And about a mile down the road, I was knocking on the lady's door so I could call home to get a ride. The angel picked me up, took me over there and dropped me in front of that door. I'd be dead today. I have had cars cut in half right down the middle. The rear end's over there, the front end's over there, and I'm sitting there on the pavement. No scratch. Listen, when you are born, angels are assigned to you. And if you're called to a fivefold ministry, you're gonna dig it. he's gonna double up the angels. Because fivefold ministers are the most rebellious people. They are. Before they get a hold of God, I mean, they're wild people. Wild people. All right, let's go to the next one. The rate of return in kingdom giving. Listen to this now. The tithe opens up the windows of heaven for you. He rebukes Satan from destroying everything that God has given you. He restores relationship with him. Because the tithe does say it restores relationship with God. Well, wait a minute. The blood of Jesus made the way. Yes, it did. But he's not going to make you have a relationship with him. It's a choice. Obedience brings you into relationship with God. The blood gives you access to God. But obedience brings you in relationship. So the tithe is the beginning of this relationship. The offering, all grace abounds toward you. He meets all your needs. He gives you bread for food, which is revelation. He multiplies your offering, increases the relationship to intimacy. And gives you more than enough to be a blessing to someone else. Are you all experiencing that? First fruit. God puts you first in all things that pertain to life throughout the whole year. That's why he wants to do it in the first quarter, the first part of the year. Number two, God sanctifies the rest of the year. Sets it apart for you. He puts 
you number one for the rest of the year. For those who have businesses, you'll have more business than the person who didn't do a first fruit. And there's great grace released at first fruit. The alms, God reimburses what you give. Now an alm is when you see and feel a need that somebody else needs. That's an alm. God just lets you see it. God lets you feel it. And that's when you move. God rewards you openly, it says, that you will never lack because you met somebody else's lack. You will never lack. I'm telling you, God sent Brother Mac into my life. It's amazing how God used Brother Mac for me. He could be a multi-millionaire. He owns all this property in the Bahamas, 40-something acres on the ocean. And God spoke to him and said to go to Guyton, Georgia, preach to the poor. Leave your wallet here. Leave everything here. Got on the airplane with no ID, no ticket. God graced the people to let him on. God's people are everywhere for him to speak to. He shows up here on one of my job sites. And the Lord said, I need you to, I want you to help that man. I was a two-year-old baby Christian, didn't know what to do. So I didn't do nothing. <laughs> what kind of help does he need? Tell me something. So I didn't do nothing. So the guy that was pouring my concrete on that day came to my office. He said, I know God spoke to you that day. So, you know, me and all my pride. Well, what did he say? What did he say? And he said, you're supposed to help that man. What does he need? He needs a big revival tent to preach out of. He has no building, no nothing. So we bought the tent. He started preaching. I started following him wherever he went. And then the Lord touched my heart to build him a new church. I saw the vision very clearly. Gave it to an architect to draw it up. That was an alm. I will never be in lack because of that. Meeting that need. Seed giving is a pathway to miracles. It will be given to you. Men shall pour into your bosom the harvest of your seed. Good measure pressed down and running over your harvest is there. We can confuse. This order in the church is confused right now. The Lord said the order is confused. So when an order is confused in the church as a whole, there's chaos in the spirit realm. There's war in the spirit realm. The enemy is going to make sure that you don't get a full return on what left your hands. Because he's eating it as it comes back because it's out of order. So the percentage that he eats is the percentage of how carnal we are. That percentage matches the percentage of carnality in us. We're doing, going good on time. All right, let me, let me get some word here. So he said his tithe is not, the, the, his tithe is not for offering. A lot of saints don't like to give tithes because the minister is going to abuse it and he's going to, use it for something that shouldn't be used for and of course we've seen all that 
That's why the Lord told me, when you start this ministry, you're going to finance it. You're not going to ask the people for no money because they've been hurt by misappropriated funds in churches. So I did for three years. And then he said, time's up. You don't have to fund it anymore. Talk about giving. One time, I did one time, and I never mentioned it after that until certain times like this. It's not an every service thing that we say, bring your tithes, bring your offerings. Whew, man, that just wore me out when I used to go to some of those churches. I, my, my leg muscles were sore from getting up so many times. They'd want the tithe, sit down, sing, now bring your offering. Sit down and sing, now bring your seed. Oh, Hazel has a need over here. Can you all sew to that? Now bring your arm. Confusion. Chaos. Listen to this. Kingdom dynamic on your seed. Jesus opened up a whole new way of living. We can no longer pay or sacrifice our way into God's mercy. Jesus Christ has paid our debt before God and his cross is completed work in our in eternal interest. Our giving then is no longer a debt that we owe, but a seed that we sow. The life and power source is from him. Ours is simply to act on the power potential of that seed life he has placed in us by his power and grace. Notice that when Jesus said give, he also said, and it shall be given to you giving and receiving receiving belong together only when we give are we in a position to expect to reach out and receive a harvest and Jesus said the harvest will be good measure pressed down shaken together will be running into your bosom isn't that cool does that motivate you does that motivate your faith because seed giving is for you a desire to be met. I had to sow for my wife. Money affects everything. I said, Lord, this seed is for her. I didn't know her. You get to sow. The seed is for my healing. Said, Lord, this is a seed for my healing. This is seed for my children. You do have to name your seed. I know a lot of ministers take advantage of that. But you do have to name your seed. The seed has to be named. It has to be named. Lord, this is a seed to get rid of my fear. This is a seed to get rid of my pride. This is a seed. It works. It works. Given it shall be given to you, good major, pressed down, shaken together, we're running over your bosom. What's the next one? Seed sowing redeems the Abrahamic covenant. This is what seed giving does. I will make you a great people. What does that mean? Who is a great people in the Bible? Who is a great people in the Bible? You. The born again Christian is a great nation. He said, I will bless you. I will make your name great. When he says that, when people think of your name, they think of authority. I will make your, you a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And all the people will be blessed through you. That's seed giving. What's next? Offering returns. Look at this on the offering. All grace comes to you. Not just some. All grace Abundant earthly blessings, more seed to sow, 
more revelation knowledge, bread for the f food for the soul, multiplication of your resources, increases intimate relationship with the Father, bearing the fruit of goodness and kindness and love, enrichment in every way that you may be more generous. He said, this is what the church is lacking. They think their tithe is their offering. We should be giving him the tithe and the offering. So when do you give the offering? When is the offering, when should the offering be given to him? The offering is for revelation. When he has given you a revelation and you caught it, you're thankful because your life is fixing to change for the good. And you say, Lord, I'm going to sow that. So every time you come in here, if you hear a revelation that just grabbed you, that you actually caught it, you better sow something. You better ask the Holy Spirit what to sow to Jesus. You know why? It finishes the completion of the revelation in the physical realm. So we say meditate on it three times, right? And we declare that revelation. But the offering is missing. The offering should have been right after the revelation before you meditate. So we're talking about two anointings here. The anointing for giving, the anointing to receive, the grace to do both. So when the offering is not in place and you're declaring the word of God, the latter anointing is missing. That's why it's taking so long. I said, Lord, why did it take so long? You told me to meditate on this three times and declare it and then wait. But the wait's been a really a long time. It will come back, but it won't come back in its fullness. It won't be complete to where God wanted it to be. What else is on here? Then we're going to pray. You know, in Corinthians, in Corinthians... Uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Let's go to that, those scriptures. Go to those scriptures. Can you hear the second Corinthians? Um, should be. Second Corinthians nine. One through whatever talks about the offering. I didn't know this until this week because this is one of my favorite verses here in giving because it says it increases the fruits of your righteousness that's what that's what motivated me to give because it increased the fruits of my righteousness so what is righteousness so it was increasing the fruit of my relationship with him. I was coming into more intimacy with him every time I gave. So, so that's what motivated me to give. It, I, the, the receiving didn't motivate me that much. I just wanted more of him. How many just want more of him? Money doesn't matter. When money doesn't matter, he'll give it to you. 
But as long as it's your security, he will not give it to you. You're going to have to work for it. So listen, now it is, it is necessary for me to write to you about the offering. That is to be made for the saints in Jerusalem. Paul was saying to the Corinthian church, prepare your offering before I get there. So Paul actually sent two disciples to the Corinthian church to prepare their offering for his revelation. A year in advance. Can you imagine somebody coming to this door and say, hey, prepare your offering for so-and-so to come next year. That's how important the offering was. But the offering was for the saints in Jerusalem to meet their needs. So the offering is saying, thank you, Jesus, for the revelation. And the other part of it is for the saints, you. It's, it's coming. Keep going. Oh, finish the verse? Okay. Paul was saying to the Corinthian church, before you prepare your offering before I get there, so you don't miss the opportunity to partner with wisdom. So wisdom is what? Wisdom is what? The what? The Word of God. Wisdom is revelation truth being presented to you. So when you get a revelation, that's wisdom being presented to you. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God. He's being, being representing to you, presenting himself to you in that moment when that thing jumps off the page or you hear something in church and it grabs you, that saying here is the wisdom you need to get on the other side of your lack and embrace what he has for you. The tithe is for spiritual food in God's house. Let's keep going. Let's go to Corinth. Keep going. Oh, wait a minute. Paul was saying to the Corinthian church to prepare their offering before he comes to minister for the saints in Jerusalem. We should be a blessing to others, other churches. We should be a blessing to other churches. When I go to King Jesus' ministry, I am a blessing to that church. I give to that church a lot of money. Because the Bible says to be a blessing to other churches. The offering is set aside for that. Paul was going to travel 817 miles. Look at that. From Corinthian, from Corinth to Jerusalem to take the offering to them. So he didn't take the offering. Most, most leaders take the offering. But it's for you. You're going to see once we get this thing right. That Zinni, thank God for my wife. I can trust her with the finances of this church. She does a lot of church work. She can be trusted. She has a lot of integrity. And uh, I can trust her. So, so she can tell me this is what the offerings were. So when you give offering, you need to say offering. Then we have money set aside to fix your roof, to fix your car, to help you pay an electric bill. The offering is for you, not for the minister, not for Jesus. He just, he just wants to say thank you for the revelation. That's all I want. Just say thank you for the revelation. We should do the same. Don't come to church empty-handed because you might hear something that will change your life forever. The offering is up to you on the amount. It comes from a thankful heart. The offering is, is for the ministering of the saints. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Now, remember this. He who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. That blessings may come to others. Will also reap generously and be blessed. Next. Keep it going. In fact, he said, giving thanks 
and everything is his will for you if you want to be in the perfect will of God thank him for every circumstance don't thank him for your sickness just thank him for what he's doing amen thank you for what he's doing there are three things to do depending on the circumstance to stay in God's will in the process of waiting rejoice always pray without ceasing and give thanks in everything amen, amen. <laughs> first Thess Thessalonians says rejoice always delight in your faith be unceasing and persistent in prayer and in every situation no matter what the circumstance be be thankful and continually give thanks to God for this is the will of God for you in who? Christ Jesus, not Jesus Christ. Jesus is up there. Christ never left. Thank God. He is the anointed one. His anointing never left. It stayed. Most Christians give tithes but not offerings because they don't understand the purpose of the offering. Here's the purpose. Let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Keep it going. Willing, good nature. This is joyful. This is, this is cheerful, willing, good nature, joyfully ready, sweeping away all restraints. I'm telling you, when God says to give, doesn't it sweep away all restraints? I mean, there's so much grace and so much liberty just to let it go, just to let it go. When God tells me to buy a car for someone, man, I get so excited, so excited or truck, whatever it is. He's done that all my Christian walk. And there is nothing more joyful. I don't remember, you remember, that? what was the older couple that came by here? The evangelist. What were their names? They had a big truck and pulled a trailer and they would just travel. They were in their late 70s and 80s pulling this tra travel trailer. He was an evangelist. And he would go to different churches, and he would come here. And uh, the Lord told me to buy him a new truck, a big diesel, a big diesel truck. I mean, it was a big diesel. You remember that? And it was, were you here then? The big diesel. That man walked out there. He fell on that hood and cried like a baby. Man, the joy flooded my heart when that happened. It causes many thanksgivings to God. There was a guy that came in here to visit us for something. He was a missionary or something. And, and the Lord spoke to my heart and said, give that man $5,000. I walked up to him, gave him a check for $5,000. He ran out the door. I thought he was mad. When I looked out there, he's running back and forth in the parking lot with so much joy, throwing his hands up, praising God. Man, that blesses your heart. God loves a cheerful giver because it gets results. The reason the word, the reason the word put tithes and offerings together because of the anointings that are associated with both. Anointing means the power of God. God's power shows up to bless you, protect you through the tithe. Secondly, on the offering, God's power shows up to change you and give you the desires of your heart to bless others through the offering. Malachi talks about a polluted offering. Make sure your offering's not polluted. What pollutes an offering? You don't know? Giving grudgingly. Giving out of necessity pollutes the offering let's keep going keep going a polluted offering in short is given 
grudgingly and of a necessity. This is without the reverence to God. Go ahead. The Bible says that the, that the tithe restores relationship with us and the Father. Jesus bridges the gap through his blood, but obedience restores the relationship. How many of you all want a relationship with God? If you're not, if you're not obedient, the closer I got to God was through my giving. Because he set the example. He gave his son to set the example. The son was sent for what purpose? Relationship. He was sent to restore the relationship between us and the father. I hope you all are getting this. To bring you back into existence, back into a formal state, Adam, to put again into possession. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm going to go to the next scripture. And God is able, listen to this. This is through the offering. God is able to make all grace and favor, earthly blessing come in abundance to you. We've got testimonies on this. I can't wait to hear them in January. So, so that you may always under any circumstance, any circumstance. What's it say? Regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient self in him, and have an abundance for every good and charitable work. And what did you do to get this? You gave your offering. Look at what God does when something leaves your hands. No Christian should be in lack. No Christian should be sick. Jesus came to redeem all that curse. And your giving affects every bit of it. People are sick because they don't give their tithe. We pray, we pray, we intercede for them. The Lord said, you're wasting your time. He said, you're wasting your time. I said, what do you mean? He said, the tithe is not in place. The offering is not in place. The alm is not in place. If we don't give him what is his, we are considered a thief. Would you bless a thief? No. No? All grace will abound towards you. It's a, it's a manifold release of grace. He manifests it towards you. Keep going. Revelation complete. And have enough left over to meet the needs of others. <clears throat> Keep going. Keep going to the next verse. Now. Say now. Say now. He who provides seed for the sower. Are you a sower? How do we sow? We sow in words, and we sow by our hand. That's a sower. He provides seed to the sower and bread for food. Will supply, will provide and multiply your seed for sowing. Now, we're talking about the offering now. He's calling it a seed. Your seed for sowing, that is your resources, and increase the harvest of your righteousness which shows itself in act of goodness and kindness to God. Are y'all getting weary? Is your flesh getting so irritated? I don't have a glyph. I need to give a five. I got my little pouch there. The seed pouch. 
Keep going. I'm almost finished. Now, he who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will supply. Go to the next verse, we. Next verse, next verse. Second Corinthians 9.11. You will be enriched in every area, every way, so that you may be generous. And this generosity administered through us is producing what? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving to God from those who benefit. I'm going to give you a little testimony. I've already given you three, two. Um, remember, I used to pray for this old, old black widow. I just love black people. All right. He says I do too. <laughs> God has put a love in me. I was at Costa Cathedral Church, and he said, you see that black widow over there? She was 80-something 80 80 years old, Sister Murray. And she would just sit there quietly. I could see her praying for the service and praying for this and that. And she would, he, he would say, I want you to go up to her and say the Lord said to, your, you, said to her, to, for me to pray for you, with you every Tuesday and Thursday night. And we'd put up a chair like this and our knees, knees would hit. We'd be that close because we'd pray so long that our arms would get tired so we'd rest them on our knees. And as soon as we locked hands, you know how you're quicken with the Holy Spirit? Like, oh, like that, that you just quicken. We would pray for three to four hours in tongues every Tuesday and Thursday night. He said, do it until I release you. When I first walked in the house, you could feel the presence of God. And I, know, I kept looking at the carpet. I kept looking at the floor. I don't know why. I looked down the hall. And the Lord said, I want you to replace all the flooring in her house. I said, why? He said, because some real estate agent didn't follow through with an agreement that her flooring would be replaced in this house that she just bought. And she's been praying. She's been grieved. It was nasty. It was that old, long, green shag carpet. It smelled like dogs were in there or something. So anyway, I said, Sister Murray... The Lord just told me to replace all the flooring in this house. Now, she was 80-something years old. She jumped up and ran down that little three-foot hallway back and forth, thanking God, praising God, hallelujah, praying in tongues. It went on and on and on. I don't think we even prayed that night. What had happened? It caused many thanksgivings to God. But you got to hear his voice. <laughs> And see, if you're not hearing his voice, then your tithe is not in place. The tithe restores the relationship. The blood gives access to the relationship. We prayed for two years, every Tuesday and Thursday night. One thing about me, I will never give up on anybody. Two years. Locked in with that old lady every Tuesday and Thursday night, praying for all kinds of stuff. And felt like we hadn't prayed for 30 minutes, the glory of God would just show up. Not knowing that Part of that two years was intercession for this ministry and you sitting here. Isn't that amazing? It's powerful. Next. Next. Because of this act of ministry, see, they passed the test. They will glorify God for your obedience. That's what she did. To confess the gospel which you confess, as well as your generous gift for them and for all the believers in need. 
The offering is for <laughs> believers when they have a need. Next, next. And they also long for you while, you while they pray for you. Now they're praying for you. You got another intercessor. Because the surpassing measure of God's grace, undeserved favor and mercy and blessing, which he has revealed in you. Isn't that awesome? I just love the word of God. I don't know about you. Y'all love the word? Praise God. And um, so everybody's got their hand out, right? Go to James 1.22. Got two scriptures, then we're going to take a break and I'm going to release this grace. <laughs> this is one of those messages when I sat down in North Carolina, but my hand just would not stop writing. It's amazing how he does that. Your mind, it's surpassing your mind, everything. It's just the spirit taking over. He said to be doers of the word. Obey the message. Y'all going to obey this message? And not merely listeners to it. Betraying yourself into further deception. How many of y'all just hear the word and don't do it? You just went to another dimension of deception. And deception makes you think you're right. But everybody else sees you're wrong. It blinds you. Betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. Next verse. But be doers of the word, obey the message. And, oh, for he observes himself. For he who observes himself goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man. No, that's not the verse. It's 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now, what is the law of liberty? What is the law of liberty? Revelation. He who looks into the law of liberty and revelation knowledge and continues in it. How does he continue in it? Huh? How do you continue in it? Meditating. Meditating. You meditate on it. You're continually in it. You're meditating on it. And is faithful to it and perseveres in looking into it, being not a headless listener, heedless listener who forgets but an active doer who obeys, he shall be blessed in his doing in his life. So listen, when you get a revelation, let's get this down, and, I, and then we'll go into a few song, one song, actually. Um, when you get this down, when you hear a revelation, when you get a revelation, give him his offering. He might just ask you to give a dime. But look at all the benefits that come with that time. You know, you never know. He's not going to put a burden on you. He's not going to speak to you to where you have to reason it. He's going to speak to you at the level your heart is in thanksgiving to him. He's going to speak to that measure, that level. Give it. Then meditate on it three times like we instruct here. Then declare it. And what happens after de declaration, it goes into a law of life and peace. And that law, when it starts coming back with the answer, the physical answer, the completion of the revelation, boom. Trial just hit. Now, obedience is required. That's when obedience is required. Then you embrace a new thing. 
that you've never had in your life before. All right. Give God some praise.